Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, relatively early morning, and as Jeremy said, here at the end of the year when things get pretty busy. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Jeremy and the Creative Mornings team. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, and maybe even a special thanks to the coffee and donut people today. Um, so this morning, uh, I am really going to be clinging to the Creative Mornings idea that everyone is creative. Because if not, you're going to be thinking, wait a minute. Uh, recently, we had a illustrator, graphic designer, sketch artist, and now some guy who barely knows how to use PowerPoint. Um, so I'm clinging to that idea. And actually, I do believe that. Everyone is creative. And I've spent uh, the last 15 years creating at the intersection of spirituality, community, and social impact. Now, some of you might think, for some of you, that might be kind of foreign to the work that you're involved in. But my hope is that, that what I share this morning as I talk about the, the practice of silence, uh, I hope that it resonates with you. And I'm pretty sure that some of the stories I share, uh, you certainly will find yourself uh, in them. So uh, before we continue, I want to ask you to do me a favor. Would you be willing to, um, well, there's some contact info. See, already demonstrating, it doesn't know the PowerPoint thing. Um, would you be willing to pull out your phone for a second? And I invite you to put it on airplane mode. And to be clear, this is not for me. It's not because I'm demanding your undivided attention. And it's probably not because of the building, because we're kind of in a bunker of sorts already. <laughs> this is to serve as a symbol and a reminder for you today that um, we are thinking about silence, and maybe even remember this moment going forward into the holidays. So as you've done that, let's just take a moment to take a deep breath. Maybe you want to close your eyes. And whenever you're ready, at your own pace, I invite you to take a deep breath in, a big belly breath. Breathe in and up into your chest. And maybe hold for a second. And release. And maybe one more. Breathe in through your nose, into your belly. Draw further breath into your chest, and exhale. Just take a moment to notice the sounds of this space. Maybe it's the gurgling stomach of the person next to you, or the air through the vents, a cough. Maybe you're remembering some of the sounds that brought you here this morning, whether that was on a bus or in your car. Maybe you were listening to a podcast. And just arrive here into this space. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes. Uh, there's an acoustic... Uh, an acoustic ecologist named Gordon Hempton who spends his time out in the, the whole rainforest out on the, um, the Olympic Peninsula. And uh, he spends his time trying to preserve spaces of silence. And he says that silence is an endangered species. Now he's referring to places that are not polluted by manufactured noise. But I think if you're like me, you might be able to find yourself in that statement. That at some point uh, in your life, silence has been on the verge of extinction. And so, as I share a couple reflections of what I've learned about silence, I want to take you back to a moment five years ago. I, I live in North Seattle, and as I do many mornings, I had run around Green Lake, and I got to 85th and Aurora, and I was charging up the hill towards Greenwood, and I got to the top of the hill, and I just stopped dead in my tracks. As these words rose up inside me, if you don't have your heart, you have nothing. If you don't have your heart, you have nothing. And I, I took out my, my earbuds, and I put my arms at my side, and instead of charging home as I normally would, I just sat there, and I, I knew what those words meant. You see, about seven years earlier, uh, I, had, I had moved to Seattle, and ever since that, that day I moved here, I had been rushing through life. I had been going at a really fast pace. Uh, in 2006, I moved here, and almost instantly, I fell in love with everyone's favorite street in Seattle, Aurora Avenue. 
<laughs> but honestly, I did fall in love with it. I know it's not everyone's favorite. Um, and within a few years, uh, this, this street changed my life. So in 2007, I began the work of, of launching a neighborhood spiritual community called Awake that was committed to, here we go, that was committed to the idea that everyone is beloved, we all belong to one another, and every single person, no matter what your race or socioeconomic back background or education, everyone has a blessing to offer their neighborhood, their city, or the world. And it was a really rich experience. And soon after that began another organization a year later with a group of friends that uh, grew out of my love for the particular place of Aurora Avenue in North Seattle. And this was a network called the Parish Collective that was committed to supporting community builders and placemakers around the country. And then the year after that, along with my friends from the Awake community, began a really special place called the Aurora Commons, which is located at 90th and Aurora. Now, Aurora Commons is... We've always talked about it as a neighborhood living room and resource center. It's a place serving and empowering the people of Aurora Avenue, many of them you might know, who are dealing with homelessness and poverty. They're dealing with drug dependence, dealing with uh, mental and physical illness, and then especially women, many of whom are sex workers, are dealing with, with violence and sexual exploitation. And we started a place to, to be community with our Aurora neighbors. Um, now, just a, a couple things. You can see just some pictures, images from the Aurora Commons. Uh, I'm no longer working there, but I'm one of their biggest cheerleaders. And I just want to make a note that if you, uh, as the year comes to an end, would like to make a gift to an organization in the city doing a fantastic uh, work, it would be making a big impact in people's lives, it would be the Aurora Commons. You can go to auroracommons.org slash give. So starting all those organizations, and around the same time, my wife started and completed graduate school, and somehow in there we had three children at one point, three kids under the age of three and a half. So you get the idea. <laughs> And you understand that that morning when I was running up that hill and those words hit me, if you don't have your heart, you have nothing. I knew it was not talking about my heart rate, but it was talking about the pace through which I was going through life and that something need to ch needed to change. It was a wake-up call. So even though all those things were meaningful and fun and I worked with great people and it was challenging work and it was impactful and got my creative juices flowing, at some point, amidst all of that, it's like my soul just sort of slipped out the back door, and I didn't even notice. But that morning, something was trying to get my attention. I would say silence was trying to get my attention. And even though uh, that day I went, I just wanted to crawl in bed, I wanted to hide in a hole, I wanted to quit everything, there was some part of me that knew that uh, I had to follow silence, I had to step into silence in order to get my heart back. So a couple days later, I'm on a bus with my daughter, and I'm in this state where I'm trying to listen for signs or trying to pay attention to anything, like anywhere I can get it. And um, my two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, she points at a guy, and she says, she says, uh, tattoo. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know you, had, you knew what a tattoo was. I don't have a tattoo. But this is Seattle. And then she says, daddy get a tattoo. I said, really? I should get a tattoo? I was like, well, what would you get if you got a tattoo? She said, I'd get a heart. And I thought, that's cute. A little cliche, but I didn't say that to her. <laughs> that is cute. And then I said, what would daddy get? And she goes, a jaguar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a jaguar. I also didn't know she knew what a jaguar was. So the next day, I got a jaguar tattoo. No, I did not. Um, <laughs> But that afternoon, I went home, and I had tucked that idea away, Jaguar. I'm like, what does this mean? Maybe this has some symbolism. And because, you know, I'm really smart, I had spent time in, in Mexico, right? So I'm an expert on Mayan culture. I knew that, that the Jaguar meant something. So later in the day, I'm watching TV, and I'm about to Google, you know, Jaguar, Mayan something. And right as I'm about to do that in my right hand, and I have a remote control in my left hand, about to switch the channel, a commercial comes on, and there's this gorgeous car rolling through the hills. And I didn't recognize it, but what kind of car do you think it was? It was a Jaguar. So instantly, right hand decides to type in Jaguar motto. I type it in, and you wouldn't believe what I found. I scrolled down, it's like the second or third entry in there, and just looking at the little, the little selection, right? Um, you tech people know what this is called, whatever that little thing is when you go on Google. The little paragraph, it says this. 
It's a, there's, a, there's a commercial from Jaguar. It's an advertisement from the Mad Men era. Grace, space, pace. Grace, space, pace. And I'll tell you, that like pierced my heart. I knew that those words were for me. Now for Jaguar, they mean like elegant, spacious, or roomy, and fast. But for me, in that crazy season of life, I knew what it meant. It meant that I needed to extend grace to myself. I needed to be present to myself. I needed to tend to my heart. I needed to receive the kindness from myself and from others. Uh, space meant, you know what, I, I just was cramming my schedule every day. I didn't ever make time for myself. I was constantly meeting with other people, responding to other people's demands. And the third thing, pace for me didn't mean faster, it meant slower. I really needed to slow down. And so I felt like in that moment, silence was getting my attention. And interestingly, uh, these three words from this Mad Men era advertisement actually line up with three interrelated, almost companion practices from some of the great spiritual traditions. Silence, solitude, and stillness. Silence, solitude, and stillness. In a way, these are, they're all different words. They, they all kind of accent, but they accent some of the same thing. And as we think about silence this morning, I invite you, it's not the absence of sound. Silence is actually about withdrawing from the demands and the distractions of daily life in order to make space to be present to and tend to your inner landscape or your inner world. So silence is about moving from an external, externally oriented kind of way of being into an internal one, right? So I knew in that moment that I had to be still. I had to begin to practice silence. And so I began in the, in the following weeks and months to do sort of what you could call silence practices, stillness practices, whatever you want to call them. Uh, I began to journal a lot. I would meditate a lot. I, uh, fortunately, during that season, I was, I was incredibly blessed to have a sabbatical. That was incredible. But perhaps most significantly for me was I started practicing yoga, and this was a whole new thing for me. And I'm not going to describe how that went for you. Um, anyone who started yoga knows how that works. But there was something profoundly different for me. Instead of like running and pounding my feet on the pavement to actually getting on a mat and having this little space for myself. And you know what, as I began to practice that, step into that silence, uh, here we go, I learned, um, I learned the first lesson that, that silence wanted to teach me. And here's the thing about silence, it, it will teach you lessons when you step into it, and it will teach you lessons in the proper time. And it will teach you lessons that are probably unique to you. And I want to share three of the things that I meant. And I, th I think they actually, while they're very particular for me, I think they'll uh, apply to you as well. And the first was that silence grounds creation in recreation. Here's what I mean by that. Silence helped me, help remind me that creativity, anything I do or make, is actually rooted, first and foremost, it, it flows out of a place of playfulness, of play. And I had lost that. So this last week, my, my son was sick. Home, he was, uh, stayed at home with a sore throat. How many have been dealing with like sickness? Okay, don't shake their hands. Um, <laughs> and my wife was home with him, and, and he usually is playing Legos all the time, particularly Avengers Legos. His Christmas list is exclusively Avengers Legos. And normally you'll hear him around the house making amazing sounds that he's learned from the movies, and he's gonna be like the guy from Police Academy, those movies back in the day. Makes amazing sounds. But um, earlier in the day, he told my wife that he wanted to play Legos, but he hadn't played, so sh she asked him later in the day, said, um, don't you wanna play Legos? And he goes, nah, I just can't play because I can't make the noises. There is something about the, the play, it was no longer in it if he couldn't fully make the noises. And I think this applies to our lives when we're busy, when we're hustling all the time, when we don't make space for silence and stillness. What happens is we can go through some of the motions, sure, we can build the thing, we can express creativity in some ways, but there's some aspect that's missing. We can't make the noises anymore. And we don't always notice it right away. We don't notice how we're becoming more serious. We're becoming more forceful and strained with our creative energies. But if we give silence some space, it will teach us that that's not the way that we need to relax and we need to let go and it will remind us to be playful. So what it reminded me of in that season was 
a couple things. Well, one, I realized that I had been carrying a lot of trauma, certainly not as much as my Aurora neighbors, but there's sort of a secondary trauma you get when you work on the front lines with people in such distress. And I realized that it affected me. The other thing was I realized I had fulfilled my purpose with some of these organizations and initiatives is that the fun was not in it anymore in part because I wasn't really living out my passions and my gifts. It was good work, but it was now someone else's to do. And so in an effort to move towards more playfulness in my creativity, I, I stepped out and, uh, and it was fantastic. And almost immediately, I felt this rush of creativity again. And I started a coaching consulting practice. I started a, a podcast called Replacing Church. It's about people who are doing innovative work around the intersection of spirituality, community, and social change. I did 99 episodes, stopped short of 100 intentionally. Um, had a bunch of other exciting things going on. And I could keep telling you, and guess what? You'll start to notice and say, well, didn't you learn your lesson the first time? So. There's an ancient proverb that says, uh, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. And that's what I was doing. And silence was not gonna let me get away with it. It was gonna call me back and, and tell me to, to be still again. And, it, it, and my wife wasn't gonna let me get away with it either. So one day, as I was like casting vision for this whole new idea, it's gonna expand this project. You have this, right? You wanna take this thing to the next level and your mind is going, you're meeting, you're connecting people, trying to make something happen. And I said, I said to my wife, I was like, what? well, what would your advice be right now? She pauses. She says, I would tell you to get quiet. I would tell you to get quiet. She didn't tell me to be quiet. She's done that. That's not what she said that day. I would tell you to get quiet and, and writing again, just like the words on the run that day and the gray space pace, this hit me, how many times do I need to learn this lesson? But it hit me again and I knew that I, I, I was not ready. There was more work that silence was inviting me into. And so in that particular season, I, I began some, continued with some of the same practices, deepened my meditation practice. I began to see a spiritual director and maybe it's a therapist or a life coach for you. Uh, I began to journal again. I read a lot of really good poetry. I wrote a lot of really bad poetry. I wandered in the wild. Uh, just being out in nature was, was huge for me. And I began to pay attention to my dreams. Began to write down my dreams and talk to some people about my dreams. And it was a tremendously healing season and in that season, I learned another lesson about what silence does, that silence resets to soul. And here's what I mean by that. that the first lesson, really, I, I had dealt with some of my surface level habits, but I had not gotten, gotten deeper and dealt with kind of the, the root causes or issues behind my inability to be still and behind my hustle and my burnout and all those things. And so as I engaged in practices during this season, uh, I began to like notice what was actually going on. I began to see the way that I was obsessed, obsessed with producing things, creating things, as a way of trying to earn the approval and affection and love of others. I became aware of how I had this obviously and always unattainable vision of perfection that I would strive towards and never meet, and guess what that does to your creativity? That will kill it. I also realized that at the core of how I often show up is this, this performance, meaning who do you need me to be right now? How do you need me to show up? And what that d did to my creativity, it meant I was always actually stepping into other people's dreams and visions and plans, and I wasn't doing the thing that is mine to do. When we step into silence, it will reset us to soul. It'll take us beyond that surface place that is ego-driven, that's about security, about some sort of stability, about approval, and it will drop us down into a deeper place where we discover what is our unique work to do in the world. We discover who we are and what the gift is that we have to give to our communities. And that is a place, my friends, it's out of that place in an immense and beautiful creativity flows. Guess what? I didn't know, I did learn my lesson. I, I'm, I'm still in it, but the other thing that came up in that season was a realization that, that silence recharges creativity. So I had uh, I'd been getting quiet, 
And yet, there still felt like there was some blockage to, I had some ideas I was sitting on for about three years. There's almost like a sense of call stirring in me to be doing some things, which I'll tell you about in a second, but there was still some blockage and I was getting distracted by concerns like, well, where do I live and what's my job and how much money do I make and those kind of things, which are, you know, legitimate concerns. But I, I kept almost obsessing. There's a, there's a difference between like discerning those kind of things and like distracting yourself and getting to a place where you're obsessing over these ideas. And that's what I was doing and it was inhibiting my creativity. And I kind of needed one more thing, almost like my capstone course in silence to push me over the edge and kind of break me open. And so six months ago, I went on a two week trip into a remote desert canyon in Utah and participated in an experience that was inspired by the, the vision quest practices of the Lakota people and um, indigenous communities from around the world throughout human history. At the center of this experience was a four day water only fast, three days of which um, I was completely by myself. Now my my, the extent of my survival experience before that was pretty minimal. Like it's basically like when I'm on an airplane in an exit row and they ask if I'm willing and able to assist, I'm able to mumble yes. That's my, my survival experience. But in that canyon, it put me in a place of vulnerability and clearly put me in a place where I was still, I was silent, and I was in solitude. And I came out of that experience. It was a time to reflect on the journey that had been before me and it was like I had, I had shed something. So I came back with this new creative spark, and it was time to move forward. And there are two things I moved forward on. One, and this one will make no sense, <laughs> it's called Mr. Mystical, says it all, right? This is a one-man show <laughs> that I, it was performed for one night only, ladies and gentlemen, up at the Pocket Theater in Greenwood, which is sadly closing at the end of this month. I hope to do it again, um, but really did this on my birthday for my friends, and it was a way of telling more stories like the weird Jaguar tattoo one, more stories like that that have shaped me over the years and inviting other people to consider all the ridiculous and sacred stories, which we all have. It doesn't matter what you believe about whatever or where they come from, we all have these experiences, and they're there, they're to guide us in life and in our creativity. So Mr. Mystical was one thing. Check that off. Hope to do it again, though. And the other is uh, really what I think is my core work. It's called Still Life. And there's really three aspects to Still Life. One is, is taking my years of experience working with hundreds of leaders as a, as a coach and uh, consultant. And I'm helping people, really, it's really transformational coaching, helping people get quiet and listen to their lives so that they can move forward and make a tremendous impact in the world, a big impact, but out of that place of groundedness and do the thing that is uniquely theirs to do. Um, Still Life also is uh, a pop-up event, uh, which I have a slide for in a second. These are some photos from it. Uh, it's a community meditation experience fe featuring music. We've had two of them so far at The Collective, and there's another one next week. Um, and the other element is that I'm, I'm a, a trained and certified meditation teacher and teach a very simple meditation practice that anyone um, even if you don't want to be a meditator, you don't see yourself as a meditator, you don't have to, and you have resistance to it, this is a really easy way to learn this, which is a wonderful silence practice that will help you in creativity and help you, I think, live with more joy and, and connection and belonging. So these are some photos from Still Life and, uh, and just kind of my summary statement about these three lessons. This is like kind of the, the core piece is that creation, specifically recreation, follows quiet. So you've had creative seasons in your life. If you're here, you've had that. Uh, and then sometimes there's, there's, there's uh, you know, you get stuck or you burn out. And the truth is that when you enter into silence, stillness, and solitude, uh, and it might take a long time, and it might feel like a certain death of sorts, but there's going to be at some point, a rebirth. There's going to be a moment where you will re be able to recreate again. You'll tap into your creative source. Um, and that comes after quiet. That comes after silence. Um, so, just put this up here. This is for the next event, next Wednesday. I would love to see some of you if you need a little extra space to be still in this holiday season. It's happening at the collective, and there is a discount code. CM silence, you get 50% off. So you have to go to stilllifehere.com. Um, hopefully we can get a link in an email. Um, 
or you can find out at Eventbrite. And also, I'm, I'm starting a couple courses in the new year, and you can find out more for information by going to my website. Um, yeah, that's really not the, the best way to end it. Here's how I want to end this. Um, in a second, we can turn, you know, turn our phones back, uh, take them off of airplane mode. Isn't that ridiculous, though? It's a state of, of our relationship with silence that our, we have this symbol of silence that's related to some, a tin can fl flying at 35,000 feet at 500 miles an hour, that that's the place you got to go. And actually, there's Wi-Fi on board and 750 movies available on Alaska Airlines. But let's just take a moment here at the end before we go into groups and, and have um, you get into the Q&A, just to, to close your eyes again. And again, take a deep breath whenever you're ready, whatever kind of breath you want, but I encourage certainly a deep breath. And one more breath in. And hold. And exhale. And before you open your eyes, you'll notice, like, it is not absolutely silent here. There's sounds here, right? So again, sound, silence is not about escaping sounds. And actually, we're with other people. But even in this simple moment, there's a sense by closing your eyes and taking a breath, you're able to reconnect with yourself. So I hope you take that into this hectic end of the year. And um, as you give presence to others, make sure also to give presence to yourself. And you can open your eyes whenever you're ready. And thanks so much for having me this morning. Okay. First question. Hello. And I, I reserve the right to respond with silence to any question. Deal. Hello, Ben. Thank you for speaking today. Um, I think our group has come to the consensus that we would like to ask with a passion and almost need to produce as part of your creativity. I think that resonates with a lot of folks here. It resonates for me particularly. Um, how do you monitor yourself to not go to that place that caused you to spin out and drastically need silence? So the question is, as someone who has that kind of need and drive and like part of who, who they are is to produce and make things, how do you balance that out so that you don't, like I did multiple times, fall back into kind of unhealthy patterns and lose connection with yourself? Um, I mean, I think the, the main thing I would say is like just the power of habit. And um, that's true whether it's meditation or journaling or obviously exercise or anything that um, you place these anchors in your day. Maybe it's in the morning, maybe morning and evening or afternoon or it's on your commute. I was just talking with Jeremy about like the, the difficulty of finding quiet space, especially when you have a newborn or something like that. And it's like just looking for those little windows which might be on your bus ride or driving your car without listening to a podcast or music and finding stillness. So I think whatever it is, if you can find something and actually commit and say, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this every day or I'm gonna do this three days a week. And um, then what happens is like, you know, and if you fall off the wagon, that's fine. You get back on, you miss a day, you, you start over. Um, but with that anchoring practice, which I think has gone next level for me over the last year, uh, it enables me it almost is like a, a check on my my producing and making. Like in some sense, what I've been up to the last many months is like just as kind of busy. Like it's this, a lot of stuff just like I have in previous eras. But the thing I've prioritized is I've, I've trusted that having the habits and committing to silence, solitude, and stillness, even in some small way, is actually gonna come first. And then the creativity flows even more easily when you kind of anchor in those practices. Whereas before, the sense was, um, this is easy to get in this sense, but you start to think, well, if I, I can't give time for this because I have all this work to do. But the reality is when you're, when you're really straining to do work, it actually is gonna take more time and more effort. But when you practice these things, it actually, it makes it a bit more fluid. So it's an, it, the answer is habit and it's balance, which you probably knew that, but that's where I go with that. Thank you. Thank you. 
We were talking about the distinction between silence and inactivity. Can you speak to that? Mm, that's great. Like Netflix binging or something like that, perhaps? Um, Disney Plus, Mandalorian, anyone? Uh, so I, I actually think that silence or solitude or stillness, it's, um, I see it as the place between, it's the center place between striving and squandering, and, um, which would be, I think, inactivity. There's a sense that inactivity, as I view it, in some ways could be actually really unhealthy. It's an abdication of responsibility. You're refusing to do the thing that's yours to do, or you're, you're afraid to do it, or you're not willing to take the risk. Um, and obviously, on the other end, though, is, is striving, where it's like you wrap your identity up in this thing, and you feel like you're the only one, and it has to happen, and it has to happen this way. And that's part of what my narrative was. Um, so th the thing is to try and not have, when you get burned out, it's easy to just have a pendulum swing. If you've been striving just to go over here, squandering, which means you're wasting your time. You're not actually getting refreshed. You're just, it's like, um, yeah, it's inactivity. It is, there's nothing renewing or refreshing about it. But when you're in this place, that center place of silence or stillness, that practice, I think, helps you discern what's healthy rest. And that may include, like, and it will for me over the holidays here, I hope to watch some movies and chill out and all that. But um, it also is like you're keeping your eye on sort of a healthy rhythm of creating. Really is a, it's a ball. Um, <laughs> do you <laughs> um, do you have any um, daily or weekly practices that um, specifically help you tap into that feeling of playfulness that you mentioned about creating? The question is, do I have any daily or weekly practices that help me tap into playfulness? I mean, it's it's. So just, just as it's harder, it's typically harder for people who have young children to like find the silence and stillness, they also have an advantage because they're around little people all the time. And um, in, especially in that first season when I burned out, it's, it was pretty easy to like get back into playfulness. Like when you're, but, you, but you have to be, it's like difference between I go to the park, go to Karkeek Park, it's like my favorite park, and we're gonna, we're gonna hike the loop here. The kid's like, no, and like, look, a slug. <laughs> and you want to stare at the slug forever. <laughs> like, I have to let them lead, right? So, so at one level, it's like get around some, some little people, right? Whether it's nieces or nephews or friends, kids or whatever. Um, but other practices? I mean, does karaoke count? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like to sing karaoke. Uh, karaoke... I, I do think um, that reading, particularly fiction, can be something that helps bring out that playfulness. Even if it's like sort of dramatic and intense reading, there's something of it takes you, it expands your imagination and brings you into another world. Um, and I think just living at times with, a, with spontaneity is a powerful practice. I mean, it's hard to, like, it's a habit, but it's not like a, every day at 10 o'clock, I'm going to be spontaneous. <laughs> it's just a general posture in relationship to life. Well, maybe I need to say yes to that. Start saying yes, you know? Thank you. It's a hand back there. I don't want to throw it. Are you, you there? Are you um, there? Within the Christian tradition, there are, a, oops, sorry, thank you. Um, within the Christian tradition, there are a lot of retreat-style practices. And so for those of us who are a little bit more introverted and don't have a problem with that, but have a trouble with taking that still place and moving back out, did any of your journeys teach about that? How do you make yourself reconnect? So coming back from the retreat? Right. The question is, like, in some traditions, like the Christian tradition, there's, like, a good kind of culture, or can be, <laughs> around retreating and withdrawing. Um, and the question has to do then with how do you come back from that, which is maybe a question of, of reintegration. So I think on one level, if you're talking about like I'm getting away for two weeks or a weekend, which is definitely, I, I admit, there's like a luxury to that, getting out in the woods and camping or whatever it is. Um, there's a sense that I think the e it's easier to integrate those experiences and have them feel like they're not a one-off experience when there are some daily or weekly habits of retreat. And what I mean is like retreating to 
the local park where you walk in the woods for 20 minutes or retreating to that place in your office because I know some of you probably work at fancy places that actually have spaces where you can go be quiet whether you choose to use it or not. But when you develop or it's just the, the daily practice of meditation and going and sitting whether it's the same place all the time or it's in your front seat of your car or in your office chair or whatever, there's a sense that that regular rhythm of retreat it helps you, it helps kind of cut off the, the, the curves of the kind of dramatic nature of reintegrating after a retreat experience. Um, and it's also very helpful, one other thing would be to have like companions for that journey. So there's a, I think it's a Celtic term, that's anamkara, it means soul friend. If you have that kind of friend like, that you can open up to about kind of where you're at or whether you're burning out or you're, you don't feel yourself or you're, you're trying to make more space for your soul or for silence. Having someone like that who's, who's also a regular part of your life is going to help with that integration process. And of course, to find people like that, you also have to be willing to be vulnerable and open up so that others feel invited to do the same. Over here. Yeah, I was hoping to see a little Russell Wilson action there, but it didn't happen. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, silence in the workplace, inside organizations, uh, where a lot of us are navigating pressures to be constantly connected, and email, and Slack, and all the other tools that are constantly notifying us and pulling us in and breaking the silence. So I was wondering, we were all wondering, if you have a point of view on how we can create value for silence within organizational or corporate work structures when there's a lot of data-driven connectedness pressure. Okay, the question is just sort of broadly about like how to create spaces for silence in a workplace culture where there's kind of the tyranny of the urgent of email and Slack and, and communication channels that are constantly open. Um, I actually was chuckling earlier when the, uh, Jeremy, what's, is it called Distributed? What's the name of that podcast? Um, from whoever, the WordPress guy, Distributed. I was wondering like, how many people here are like, I'm gonna send this to my boss so I can work at home. Um, so that's, that's a question I'm really, I'm really passionate about. Because um, the reality is that and this, I know this is counterintuitive in, to some level in certain data-driven corporate spaces, but the reality is that like a daily meditation practice, for example, just for one person, so even separate them out from the workplace for a second, it, it ha shows dramatic benefits in terms of reducing stress and uh, increasing productivity and creativity and a whole host of other brain benefits that we don't need to get into now. But so even that, like if you start with yourself and you're like, I want to develop this practice, um, you could read up on some of that and, and initiate, and I realize that that might feel intimidating to some of you, but initiate a conversation with a supervisor or someone on your team to say, look, every afternoon from or after lunch or whatever, I need to take this period. And you could start with five, 10, 15 minutes. And, um, and I just need to do this. And so I'm gonna be offline. I'll be back on after, and actually I'll be probably more I'll be sharper than I was before I had that time. So there is definitely a piece of personal initiative and being willing to, because um, I, mean, I think a lot of us would be surprised by how much people we work with would say, actually, that sounds great. Why don't you do that? But it's our own, and I actually had that with some of my work. It's like I, I was refusing to like step up and say, I want this and I want to do this. And I'm gonna, and it was like, I was worried they were just gonna say no. Well, guess what? Um, you have to take the initiative sometimes. So that's like at an individual level. But imagine when you start doing that and your teammates start seeing the impact. I do believe that's how some corporate culture can shift one person at a time. But um, of course, there's also broader practices. You have a team of people. Well, how can we, um, this is what I like to help people do. How can you redesign even what meetings look like or what um, other habits or patterns around communication you have so that you can create just even in small ways more, more room for silence and more room for that creativity to, to bubble forth rather than everyone and so many of us right, feel the pressure to be constantly doing things. So those are a couple things. I'm not sure if that's answering everything, but thanks for the question.